Imagine with me for a minute that you're on a movie set. And you, uh, you hear the... Now, I've never been on a movie set. I can only imagine. I've seen pictures of what it's like. I don't, I don't know what it's like. But I, I, don't, I can imagine that you hear the director say, Action! You hear the, the actor say the words, and you hear, cut! Uh, the angle just wasn't quite right. We're going to do that again. So they get things set up, and the director says, action! The actor delivers his lines. He fumbles a little bit, and they say, cut! Let's try that again. Action! The actors say their lines, and he yells, cut! We're getting a shadow! We got to make some adjustments. We'll do it again. They make the adjustments. The act director hollers, "Action!" Our actor delivers their line, and then he says, "Cut! Cut! Cut!" There's got to be more feeling in it than that. Let's try it again. Action! They deliver their lines, and he says, "Cut!" That's not bad. That's pretty good. We need to do it a couple more times to make sure we get it all right and do it from other angles. So the action and again and again and again. It's exhausting doing the same thing over again and again with the same, trying to get the same emotions and the same emphasis. Randall Wallace, he was a screenwriter of the movie Braveheart. He said the most exciting day of a movie is the first day. The most boring day is the second day. It's tedious work. You ask any actor if it's worth it, then they'll say yes. Our lives are made up in that same type of fashion sometimes. Take one, take two, take another, on and on. It seems like that We never seem to fully meet our obligations or fulfill our purpose. But we still strive to do that with excellence. How many times does it take to get it right? Well, it takes as many as it takes. Sometimes it all comes together pretty quickly. Other times we find ourselves doing it again and again. You know, others see the end results, but they don't see all those day-to-day activities, those struggles that we go through. But they see the rewards at the end. Our journey with the International Mission Board has been long, tedious. For the last almost two years, working through the medical clearance, the interviews, and all of those things, and now... It's come to that end of that. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Is it worth the retakes in your personal lives? Seems like you're learning that lesson again. Seems like I've gone through this before. Lord, help me to learn each day. And as we prayed earlier, each day is better. Let us walk closer than we did yesterday. But are we ready? Action. You're entering a new phase, a new chapter in the history of this church. And God is going to do some amazing things through this church. Who's the church? It's each one of you that are sitting here. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, But as for you, brothers, Brothers and sisters, do not grow weary in doing good. So how do we do good? What is he talking about? You know, that's uh, what I want to call guard duty. God is calling us to guard duty. In Proverbs, it's a beautiful passage here. And we look at Proverbs chapter 4 is where we're going to be today. We're going to focus on verses 20 through 27. It'll give us some insights on what God expects and how we can maintain that lifestyle of doing good. Stand with me in honor of reading God's word as I begin in verse 20 of Proverbs 4. It says, my son, 
Pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings. Do not lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it is a source of life. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly, and don't let your lips talk deviously. Let your eyes look forward, fix your gaze straight ahead. Carefully consider the path of your feet, and all your ways will be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Keep your feet from evil, away from evil. Thank you. May God bless the reading of the word, and you may be seated. Proverbs, it's a, it's a wonderful book to read. I would recommend that you would read a proverb a day, and then in a month you could read through the Proverbs. And just reflect and meditate and listen to what the Spirit of God teaches you. It, it speaks of the urgency of wisdom. Now it's natural for the younger generation, those that are youth, to think that they're adults uh, that go on before them, that they're out of it. They don't understand. They don't get it. Adults don't really know what's important. Every generation in history has always thought that. But it's clearly they're wrong. Mark Twain once said that when he was 18, his father was so ignorant that Twain could hardly stand to be in his presence. Yet Mark Twain remarked that by the time he was 21, he felt that his father was, had smartened up a bit over the last three years. The difference, of course, was not his father, but Mark, Mark Twain realized that he was the one. People are in desperate need of wisdom. You don't have to look very hard in this world and you think, why don't people get it? Uh, you know, I've, I've definitely taken a break from reading the news. It's been so depressing for me and I don't need that. And you know, there was one time when I was young in my Christian life where I heard, if you give me the Bible and shut me up in a room, I'll tell you what the world's doing. Man, that is so true. The things that our world is doing, you think, yeah, the Bible said that's what's coming about. And you know, we, in our adulthood, we attempt and we should strive to attempt to pass on any wisdom we have to that next generation. They may not appreciate it right at the beginning, but with time, I think they will appreciate it. My grandpa used to say, don't mess with a bandwagon until you could toot the horn. I didn't know what he was saying for the longest time. But you know, that makes sense to me now. Perhaps Solomon here was sensing that desperation of passing on wisdom to his sons, to his children, to his descendants. You see, he had come from a family that had the classical elements of a dysfunctional family. They were messed up. Solomon knew firsthand the need for wisdom. And he also knew the calamity that can occur without the wisdom. He saw it in his own family growing up. We need some of Solomon's sense of urgency. Whether it's in our own children, whether it's in the spiritual children of those that we're discipling, ministering to, or whether it's that hard passing on that wisdom to the next generation. If we could sum up what I wanted to say here in a sentence, I would say something like, if the heart remains pure, the rest of the body will stay on course. If you want to do good, make sure your heart is where it should be. The best thing that we as parents, we as adults, could pass on to the next generation is to stay on the right path of life. And in this chapter, chapter 4, verses 1-9, through nine, Solomon focuses on what he had learned from his father David and how it was critical to make wisdom his life's goal. The chapter begins with the father telling his son to play pay close attention to the instructions that he's about to give him. Actually, the first eight chapters of the book of, of Proverbs, we hear that recurring theme, pay close attention to your ways. But this chapter, it's the clearest chapter of a father's heart for his son. 
in verses nine, uh, 10 through 19, we hear the, the challenge to choose the right path in life. You must choose between the path that leads to life and the path that leads to destruction. Choose that path that leads to life. The Father here summarizes the comparison of the two paths. One is a path of light, and the other is the trail of darkness. There used to be a sign on the road uh, traveling in Alaska. It, it said, choose your rut carefully. You'll be in it for the next 60 miles. We are in a crossroad point in our church. Not only South, not only Main Street, but all churches in America. We are never challenged more to choose our path carefully. The next section here that we read, our text today, 20 through 27, and it focuses in on what we need to do, and that's guarding our heart. Carefully consider the path to your feet, and all your ways will be established. That's verse 26. Verse 20, it's, it's the third appeal of a father to his son. The father wants his son to pay close attention to his important, important words. Pay very close attention. Don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. Solomon promises in verses 4 and 10 and 13, and he returns to that theme again and again. If you want your life, pay attention to wisdom. He also adds that you'll flourish in physical health as well. And like many of the promises in Proverbs, it does not guarantee total immunity from illness, but it will prevent us from a lot of those mistakes, and those heartaches, those trials that come because of our foolish choices that we make. Many of the things that we suffer in our world is because of bad choices or self-inflicted type wounds. So where do your affections lie? Do you hear the truth and you turn your heart on to other things? You hear the ways of God and you don't stop to dwell on them, to ponder them, to meditate on them for a while? Do we walk into a church service or do we walk around Christian brothers and sisters and we think the Christian way of thinking, but then when we're with another group, we forget about the ways of God's Word? We must set our affections on God's wisdom, on His ways, and think about it. Spend time Focusing on it. Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life, verse 23 says. The verse contains a, a, a critical concept. Above all else. Literally, it's talking about with all vigilance, keep your guard on your heart. The heart in the Old Testament it includes emotions, but it was more than that. It can refer to the whole personality, the inner life of a person. It was the source of life. Luke 6, 45, it, the heart of the source of the words is, is what Jesus explained here. A good person produces good out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil person produces Evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. So what's in your heart is the key to controlling your behavior. When I speak about meditating on God's Word, there's a, a friend of mine, he's a coach of... Mount Vernon Mountaineers football team, Tom Cox. He speaks about muscle memory in young athletes. He has, uh, he has the camp on 96. What is that called, that baseball camp? Anyway, there's a baseball camp on Highway 96. Sandlot, that's it. And, and he told, I said, what do you do there? 
because I was wanting to take my grandsons there. He said, we teach muscle memory when they're learned. They, they learn the right way of doing things. Well, meditating on God's Word is a spiritual aspect of muscle memory. It's, it's the way of focusing in on God's Word. It's a way of, of chewing on what we read in God's Word. It's musing. It's reflecting. It's digesting to the point that it becomes a part of you. It is such an important part of the Christian life. But I think it's probably more neglected than we want to admit. See, when we embrace spiritual truth, when we turn it over and over, when around and around in our hearts and our minds, within our soul, we let it sink into every corner, every crevice, and it begins to change us and have its impact on us. The Word says, Guard your heart. You might think that it means keeping the bad stuff out. And it does entail part of that. But it also means putting the good stuff in there. Letting it work. Yes, keep the bad stuff out. Yes, keep the good stuff in. Yes, dwell on the truth and peace and the fact that God of the universe is with you, living in you. He is with us. Memorizing God's Word. Meditating on the Bible. It's one of the most important foundations. One of the most important spiritual disciplines. Probably one of the most neglected spiritual disciplines as well. One of our presidents of the United States that was alive in my lifetime. I won't recall his name. But he says he reads his Bible every day. But he tries to not let it influence him. I want to scream. What's the sense of reading it? Man, that's why we read it. We want it to influence us. We want us to help us and let it use us as a guide. Some think that since we turned our heart over to God that He governs us and He shapes us automatically. It's like I heard this week about a guy who sleeps on his Bible every night. And I'd rather have my uh, memory foam pillow than my Bible under my head. I want to read God's Word. I want it to hear. I want my brain to hear it. I want to, to use God's Word to guard my heart. To be careful what I let into my heart. My heart cannot be an open door to unbiblical and ungodly influences which there are a lot of those in the world today. We need to be captivated by the Word of God. We need to give our vigilance and our intention to letting it influence our hearts. If you find yourself waiting for God to shape your heart, God is waiting for you to guard your heart. God's doing His part. Are you doing your part? Guard your heart. A part of that is guarding your eyes. In verse 25, he says, Let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. The Scripture gives us the imagery of, of walking down a path and the father tells his son, Look straight ahead. Keep your eyes straight ahead. There's a lot of things that will distract you. And you know, wherever your eyes go, that's where your body will drift to. I like snow skiing. It's been a while since I snow skied, but... You know, when I was first learning, I said, well, how do you turn? Oh, uh, you'll figure it out. No, 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 no. He said, you look the direction, then your skis will go that way. Well, it's more difficult than that, I guarantee you. But it does have something to say about that. You know, when you're driving down the road, I, I noticed my daughter, uh, my granddaughter, she's a, a new driver, and I was riding with her recently, and, and whenever she would look a certain way, the car would drift that way. We, we uh, traveled to Ireland with our, our uh, daughter and our son-in-law and our granddaughter and, and they rented a car and we rode with them and our son-in-law, they drove on the opposite side of the road and, and uh, his eyes would drift a little bit and I noticed the rumble strips on the lines would every now and then hit. We naturally go where we look. That's why it's important to keep our eyes straight ahead. 
I like what teaching is in, I think it's Hebrews 12, 2, I may be wrong, but fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Sure, there was a temptation to, hey, there could be another way. Hey, you don't need the cross. No, He, he fixed His eyes on that cross. We also need to fix our eyes on Jesus and realize that He's guiding us. You know, Jesus, He shocked His disciples when He spoke and warned them about their eyes. He said, if it causes you to sin, gouge it out. It wasn't that the eyes were corrupt and the eyes were corrupting you, but it was the fact that sin is serious and if your eyes look towards those things, it will lead you astray. It is serious. We are responsible for the things that we allow our heart to feel our heart. Words that roll off our tongue, the gaze of our eyes. We need to be aware of those irrelevant, pointless, unnecessary stares. A glimpse turns into a gaze. A gaze turns into a craving. A craving turns the heart to the side. And a misdirect heart will wreak havoc on our life, on our godliness, and our usefulness to God. And I want this church to be useful to God more so than I, you would imagine. And if we get our hearts right, if you keep our focus on the Lord, we need to take an inventory of our stairs, what we're looking at, what we're doing, and the likelihood that you will find some things that may surprise you. The hobbies that consume your time. The unholy desires. Maybe the passion contrary to God's revealed direction for your life. They'll all fall short of God's goodwill for us. When the eyes wander, our feet soon go astray. That's the teachings of verses 26 and 27. These last two verses warn us against walking the way of wickedness. I heard of a conversation two men had, and one of them said, that man must have been in the army. He said, well, how do you know? By the way he walks. The same can be said about Christians. Can people tell that you've been with Jesus by the way you walk? Guard your walk. Carefully consider It continues the idea of choosing your path carefully. When choosing the straight path carefully, we can be confident that the path is solid, that God will carry us, that God is not going to lead us down some quicksand road. He's going to lead us through a firm foundation. But when we go to the right or to the left, we'll be in deep trouble. Nothing good lies there. There's a, it's really an understatement to say that there's a vast difference between what the world understands as a straight, level, and firm ways of God. But that's nothing new. Consider Abraham. Abraham, he... He, he knew God's path. He knew God's will for him. But he, he thought, well, maybe God needs a little help. And we read about Genesis 16. And he took his wife's maid, Hagar, and thought that would be the straight, level, firm path. But that wasn't God's path for him. Consider the disciples. When they were told that the way of the cross was the way of wisdom, they thought it was foolishness and disaster. But by God's way, it was the ultimate expression of faithfulness and truth. Proverbs 4 is not telling us to follow conventional wisdom. 
It is not suggesting to play it safe. It is an order to follow God, to heed His wisdom, to trust His guidance. No matter how foolish or how skeptical the world may see that. We are to base our life on the reality of Scripture. We must understand that the straight, the level, the firm path are the ones that are straight and level and firm in God's sight. Not ours, not the world's, not anyone else's. I want to go the way God sees, God directs. Now, you may be following along this passage and you say, wait a minute, Pastor Doug, you you skipped one of those. Yes, I did, but I, I want to go back to verse 24. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly. Don't let your lips talk deviously. The verse speaks about the mouth. You can jump ahead all the way to the other end of the book to James chapter 3 and we can see some sharp words about the tongue. He said, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Words are powerful. You probably remember hearing sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is a lie. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will break my heart. The words we proclaim, the words we say, need to be words of encouragement, words of building up, words of wisdom. They can soil a good reputation or they can foil God's good plans. They can carry profound blessings, but they can carry a powerful curse. Now let me back up a minute. You cannot change God's plans. God's plans will come about. He may have to use someone else to fulfill those plans. Sometimes I wonder how many times God has gone a different direction because I refuse to be obedient to Him. Someone once said that wisdom is knowing when to speak your mind and when to mind your speech. I don't tweet, but I think that would be worth tweeting. Wisdom is knowing when to speak your mind and when to mind your speech. Some have said and taught that these verses speak against using profanity. Reading some of the various translations, I get that. The NIV says, keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. The New American Standard Translation says, put away from from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. The English Standard Version says, put away from your crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. The text I read and preach from the Christian Standard Bible, I'll read it again. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly. Don't let your lips talk deviously. It speaks so much more about just profanity. It speaks the words against saying words that are bringing corruption, perversity, gossip, deception, mindless chatter, rumors, negativity, bitterness, insults. All of those are in conflict with the teachings of Scripture. They run contrary to God's will. Why are we to do away with irrelevant, improper speech? Because our words are powerful. Both good and bad. It is our responsibility to make sure that we carry the power that builds up rather than tears down. That reflect God's image, the glory of God's image, rather than to corrupt His image. Words that honor truth rather than falsehood. 
our words, our heart, our ruts. How can you get out of the rut you're in? It all starts with your heart. How can you change your heart? Oh, we can't. But in Ezekiel 36, 26, God says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. How do I get this new heart? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Stand with me with your heads bowed. Father, I pray that, that we will seek your face as we have heard with vigilance that we will long for that heart that you will give us. God, give us your heart. Help us to walk and function and operate with the heart of God. Help this community to see that there's something different going on here. And that difference is the Holy Spirit. God, send your Holy Spirit on courts, on this church, on this church body. Father, may they look to You. Father, if there's someone here that Your Spirit has spoke to them and they have never given their life to You, I pray that they will hear You clearly and they will respond and obey Your call to come to salvation. I pray this in Jesus' name. There'll be men, the deacons up here to receive you if you want to pray. If you want to make this your private prayer altar, I would encourage you to be obedient.